Calvin, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, you caught a little bit. Of, you caught the best part of that hockey game as well. The ending th- this morning. Yes, I did. Thanks, Jerry, for having me. Man. Yeah, we're we're glad to have you here. And uh, have you watched much of the hockey? And uh, are you a fan of it? And if if you're not a fan of it, as Bob said. When you watch Olympic hockey, you really become more, to me, more of a hockey fan than you do watching the NHL. You have. You know, I've, I've seen the differences just in the rink, like Bob um, talked about a moment ago. And uh, the game just flows a little bit better. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. And the hockey game is, uh, is something that I really enjoy watching, actually going to a couple of the Pens games um, and really uh, enjoy it. You know, the fighting is, is not as prevalent in the, uh, the Olympic-style yeah, hockey yeah, that right, it is in right. the NHL. So um, both games uh, have a lot to offer, but um, it's just good seeing the USA really represent um, the hockey uh, for America right now. You know, it's funny. Every four years, uh, Bob and, and, and Calvin, at Olympic time, the game is so pure, so fast, it's so riveting, it's so entertaining, it's so exciting. And then there's always this this minor, I don't even want to call it a groundswell because that, that's a, a contradiction, but... There's this uh, a kind of minor buzz to play the game more that way and eliminate the stuff in the NHL that you that uh, uh, that's so prevalent that you don't see in Olympic hockey, and yet it never happens. They go back, they stay the way they are. Maybe it sells tickets. Maybe that's why there's 290 some consecutive sellouts. Well, of course, a little different here when you have Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, but they, they there's talk of it. But they never change. And, well, it, and to me, that's a shame. Yeah, the, the other thing too, Jerry, I mean, the, the rinks in North America are different size. Yeah. And because of the buildings. Not as wide. Not as wide. So you can't, I mean, uh, you're, you're limited. Uh, you know, it's like in football, the Canadian game is, what is it, whatever the wide width the field is. Um, so it's a different size field. And so the game is different. I, I, I agree with you that I would like to see it more free-flowing and athletic. Uh, you know, the, the, the they're going to have to do it with rules and enforcement of rules. They're not going to be able to do it with widening the no, ice. Right, you, absolutely. You can't you can't uh, tear down all the buildings you already built. Now, uh, Cowan, as a as a professional athlete, do you watch uh, other sports or or which other sports do you marvel at the athleticism and skill most? Like for me. I've always thought the basketball players were probably the most gifted athletically, but I always thought the hockey players were probably the most skilled because before they can do any of the things they do with the stick in their hands and their vision and everything else, they have to be able to skate, which is entirely different, of course, than running. So I've always thought hockey was the most skilled and that the basketball players were maybe the most athletic. How well, about you? You know, to be honest, I played basketball. Uh, I know you so. did. That's kind of why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. It's, and you're an athletic guy. Yes, you know, but I can I can never skate. Um, I, I, I struggle rollerblading. You, oh, is that so, right? So to skate on ice, you know, I, I know that's a big task um, in itself. So, you know, those are two sports that I, I really enjoy watching. Tennis is one of those sports, you know, that I also enjoy watching because just the the, the time and the effort that, that professional athletes have to put into their craft is, is unlike any other. Um, basketball, hockey, um, you know, I, I really have enjoyed um, watching hockey since I've been up here in Pittsburgh. You know, got kind of got into it last year right after the strike um, and saw, you know, the tail end of, of the season and, and into the playoffs. And it's such a, a grind, I feel, for the hockey players to be able to do what they do on a consistent basis and play more games than as, as football players we play. You know, we take a beating, you know, once a week. Those guys take a beating, you know, multiple times a week. And, and then you add skating to, to the equation, and it's, it's a hard yeah. sport. Now, probably, and everybody says this, and I agree, I still think the, the and maybe, and you could disagree, the toughest task in sports, to me, is still hitting a baseball. Would, would you agree? Of speed, the, the dips, the changes, the one, the single the most skill. difficult. R- skill. Right, I could give you yeah. that one. Uh, do, you, uh, do you think I, I, I can give you that one? You know, from 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 playing baseball when I used to, I can give you that one. Uh, hitting the ball, uh, coming 100 miles an hour at you, you know. Sometimes <laughs> dipping, sometimes dipping. Up, right. It, it, from, from from a skill standpoint, I can give you that one. Right, um, but, but I, I wouldn't call it athletic. I wouldn't. I agree. No, no, no. Right. Did, did, if I said athletic, I'm wrong. I meant the the, the single most difficult task. In, in sports to me is still hitting that baseball when you were when you were younger what was your migration I mean you played those other sports when you went to 
college did you have a chance to go to any of those other levels, or was it always football for you? You know, I played intramural basketball. Um, at I, college? At, at college. But you played in high school? I played in, in high school, Were yes, you good sir. enough to, to go play in college? Or um, no? I, I got like a couple, you know, D3, D2 um, scholarships and, and offers, but didn't didn't think that, that was the route that I wanted to go. Um, football was 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 the love that I had. You know, I love the contact. I love the camaraderie that you have. You know, among a lot of people, basketball, you just have you know just a team. You know, 10, 15 guys. Right, Whereas football, right. you have relationships that you know just stretch into different um, sectors of, of of life. But uh, you know, basketball was was where you know I had to, the 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 passion and, and just the just the the. I think it. Basketball helped me become a better football player. Yeah, I believe that. Um, and it had a lot to do with just moving your feet a lot, playing the defense, um, the speed of the game, seeing things in a different light. And I think both helped the other sport out, you know, as I, as I grew older. Baseball was never one of those sports I was ever good at. <laughs> I could well, hit, still was hitting that moving ball. I, I couldn't hit the ball for nothing. I could run the bases when I was, when I was a little skinnier. But, but hitting the ball was, was not one of those things I was good at in soccer. That was, that was just too much running for me. <laughs> Now, uh, um, uh, did you? How much? How did you grow? Um, what are you weigh now? And like when you went to college, did you did you go in as a, as a lineman? I went in as a lineman. Um, I reported my weigh in was two forty five. I was a very small offensive lineman. You're yeah. still not considered massive, though, <laughs> not, are you? Not not at all, not at all. Um, my first year, I was about uh, my first start. I started at two sixty. Really? Um, against Rice uh, University down there in Houston. The following year, I added about another fifteen pounds. Um, my junior year, uh, you know, when I started to take off, was I was I was about 290, and then uh, for my junior year, I added quite a bit of weight. And my first start uh, during my senior year was at 320. Real, is, really? And what are you now? Um, I'm about 305. That's what I thought. I yeah. thought you were lighter. And, but you you're kind of uh, uh, atypical of what the Steelers want. Mm -hmm. A a kind of a. Uh, um, I don't want to call a thin guy, but you know what I mean, a more a agile, athletic mm -hmm. type of lineman, a guy who can move who's not 340 pounds. They right. want this, the kind of, quote, smaller, m more athletic guy, huh? They do. They do. You know, they want guys that can be able to move, guys that can, can get to the second level, guys that can, you know, whatever scheme that we happen to implement that week, whether it be a gap scheme type of offense or whether it be a, a zone, um, zone running type of offense, we have to be able to adjust and be flexible. Um, and, and that's what they, you know, that's what they drafted the past couple of years, and uh, that's the philosophy that Coach Tomlin and the offensive coaches are trying to get towards. I remember Todd Haley telling me not this past year, the year before your rookie year, toward the end of the year when you were playing, he, he referred, and I, I can't remember the play, but he referred to a certain play, whether it was some type of pitch or little screen, how you were able to get out in space and block. And he remarked about that specifically, and he, and he said that that was exciting to them because that's what they're looking for, guys who can either get to the second tier or get out to the edge and, and block and, and can move. You know, and that, that brings a fun aspect to the game when, as a, as a 300-pound guy, you're able to go pull and, hey, kick out a, a linebacker that's trying to, you know, tackle a tackle a, a running back, and the running back sets him up perfectly where you get the ear hole out of bounds into his own bench or, you know, get the crack back on a, a corner or get the peel back on the lineman. You can't do it like you used to a couple years ago, but you can still peel back on the lineman within the rules of the game now. But just to be able to get out, you know, and, and not be so confined into the, the tackle box and be able to get out and run a little bit and show your athleticism, it brings some, some fun things to the game, you know, some screens, some, uh, you know, tack, tackle one-man screens. I've had a couple of those, you know, last year. Or, you know, the little toss sweeps that we've had. You know, we had uh, one against uh, Washington last year that almost went for a touchdown um, with, with Chris Rainey. Right. Um, you know, we've had, you know, some, some look, you know, we call it gator where we kind of get the tackles and the guards out and, and center, you know, when Pounce was, was here, you know, was, was playing, got him out a couple of times. And it just brings another aspect to the game and, and, and opens the offense up a little bit and, and allows the offensive linemen to have fun, not just the receivers and the quarterback. There's um, at the Steelers practice facility on the walls, different parts of the walls, there's little displays um, commemorating uh, the present and the past of the franchise at different positions. Mm -hmm. Linebackers, cornerbacks, uh, the defensive line. Uh, you know where the offensive line part of the part of the wall is? Yes, I do. Um, it was, I don't know, I, I, I would say probably the second half of last year uh, before your picture went up at left tackle. Um, did, uh, just tell me a little bit about that. Like when you knew that happened, was it that day? Did somebody tell you? Did you see it? And, I mean, does that, I don't know, 
Does that mean anything to you? You know, um, sometimes the, the small, subtle things go a long ways. Um, and I saw it. You know, didn't say anything about it. Uh, I knew my time would come when my time had to come. Um, you know, I knew my picture wasn't, wasn't there, uh, you know, for the, for the time, you know, when I started to, to, to become the starter. It didn't get put up until late into the season. Um, you know, it's one of those things, you know, I just let stuff happen as it happens. You know, when they feel that I'm the, the guy, then I'm the guy. If I'm not the guy right now, then I, then I, I know I have a, a long ways to go and a lot of work to, to continue to do. But um, you What know, do you think? What do I think? Yeah. You know, it is what it is, man. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't the starting left tackle there. Uh, well, do you consider – I mean, I, I, let, let me say this. In my opinion, um, you've done enough to be that certainly – when training camp opens, um, so I mean, do you, is that the way you look at it, or you know, I, the, the way I look at it right now is I don't want to just play the left tackle position. I want to dominate at the left tackle position, um, and until I get to that level, you know, then I still, like I said, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I'm, I'm hungry for more. You know, I'm not just content with saying, "Hey, I'm the left tackle right now," but I want to be a mainstay at the left tackle position. What do you have? Do you have anything planned for this off season? I don't know, martial arts or, you know, any of the there, – there are some, um, I won't call them strange, but, you know, different kind of training techniques, you know, hands and feet that guys sometimes will do in the off offseason. Um, that's certainly a big part of your job too. It is. You know, um, Tunch uh, Ilkin does a great job. Um, I used him last year. Yeah, he helped uh, you out, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. The uh, hands. The hands. You know, yeah. my, my, the, my, my strike – my punch, my punch has always been an asset. One of my, my offensive line, well, two of my offensive line coaches in college, um, Dennis McKnight, who played in the National Football League, and Adrian Clem, who also played in the National Football League, their big thing was hands and punching. You know, if your feet are not in line, you can still punch. You can still, you still have a chance to to win that individual battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just went to another level with with sitting down and talking with Tunch and working with him. You know, early mornings down there in the in the, the South Side barn, as he calls right. it. Um, but that's that'll be another that'll be one of the things that I continue to do, and then the the addition of our offensive line coach, you know, um, having him on staff, Mike Munchak, Mike Munchak, having him on staff, you know, I, I don't want to go out and do something different when I got a, a Hall of Famer right in front of, right in front of me. So you know, I'm a, I'm a you know drill him to right. find every every possible way to find a way to get better. And, you know, I know he's going to, to, to going to be beneficial to us. And, you know, if I want to go add something to what he's teaching, then I'll do that. But right now, you know, I want to want to use what I have right now, which is which is Tunch Ilkin with the, with the punching. And he has some martial, martial arts background right. with what yeah. he has. And then um, really utilize the coach that I have here on staff and, and Coach Munchak. So, you know, we were talking earlier about um, coaches who sometimes, you know, let uh, – that current athletes know what they used to do when they were players. Well, Tunch isn't really necessarily your coach, but has he mentioned to you yet, I know Jerry and I both know this off by heart, uh, that he never allowed a sack to Reggie White? Yes, <laughs> yes. yeah, m- multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> multiple <laughs> times, and, yeah. he, and, he, and he always gives me examples of how he trapped Reggie White multiple yeah, yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking with Calvin Beecham, the Steeler left tackle, and uh, and when we come back from the break, I want to uh, we we'll talk a little bit more about Mike Ma- uh, Mike Munchak and what it will mean having him uh, on your staff. Uh, you said something before. You don't just want to be a, a, a football player; you want to be a great football player. And that, and and you know when you hear someone say that, uh, you know obviously that that strikes a chord. And is that the way you've always approached it? I know you come in, you work hard. They love the way you work. They love the way you're dedicated. And that's just it. You don't just want to be one of 53 guys. You want to be you want to be as the guy. That's Absolutely. It. That's that's correct. Um, you know, when my my coach always had this saying, he called it just a guy, a jack. And uh, I never wanted to be just. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, uh, you know one of the things coming up in the uh, on the NFL calendar that's a scouting term is the combine. Right. The combine starts uh, next week. Did you get invited to the uh, combine? I, I was invited to the combine. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, but that's a scouting term. Like when a lot of times, if you can actually get a scout to to give you you know any information on a guy, and that's that's a term that they yeah. will use. He's, you don't want to be known as right. Guy. You don't want he's just a guy. He's just a guy. We'll talk. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about the combine too. Bob and I are going to be there next week, uh, uh, starting Wednesday. 
Uh, but uh, let's take a break, and we'll come back. We'll talk about that. And Mike Munchak as well. Calvin Boy- uh, Beecham joins us here. Uh, Bob Labriola, Jerry Dulac. We're at the Pittsburgh Auto Show. We are broadcasting from the Ford Truck Display. Stop by and say hello. Calvin's going to be with us until 1 p.m. Bob and I will be here until 2 p.m. We'll take a break. We'll come back with more on 970 ESPN. Welcome back to our special two-hour Steeler broadcast live from the Pittsburgh Auto Show at the David L. Lawrence Conven- Convention Center. Jerry Dulac and Bob Labriola with you until 2 p.m. Calvin Beecham, the Steeler left tackle, joins us for the uh, first hour. It's a, a good sports day today. Uh, not only if you got a chance to watch the USA beat Russia 3-2 to two in the shootout this morning, Pitt plays, basketball plays at North Carolina at 1 p.m. You can catch that on the tube as well. Or you can uh, join us here for some uh, good Steeler talk. Uh, we just heard a, a radio replay of uh, Le'Veon Bell, uh, Calvin, and uh, uh, what he was able to do as a rookie once he got in there, missed the first three games. The last 13 games, um, running, catching, but just touching the ball. Uh, you know, 25 to 30 touches a game. Uh, that's asking a lot of a rookie, and he responded, and it, it gives great hope and expectation to what lies ahead for not only him, you guys as an offense as well. He's a great asset, man. He's a guy that can get the ball anywhere on the field and make something special happen. Um, put him out, you go five wide, so you can put him in the slot, put him out on the linebacker, and he's able to juke him a little bit get open and, and take the ball for 30, 40 yards, and he, he even take it to the house if he, you know, runs over a safety or something. Um, and then he's able to, anytime we give him the ball, you know, from the running back position and he gets any type of crease, man, he's, he's able to really uh, bust a play and go hurdling over somebody. I think that's become his uh, right. his mainstay, <laughs> finding a way to hurdle over somebody. But Bet uh, you they talk him out of that real soon. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, man, he, he's, he's a special cat, man, a guy that, um, it's humble. Um, it's not uh, big-headed or, or, you know, getting one of those egos with, with the success he had early on in his career. And, and, it, and it's a guy that's very hungry, um, a guy that wants to become better. And, um, and he showed it every day in practice, and then you saw some of the results on the field. You know, it, you stole the words out of my mouth. I was going to say he is, a, he is a special cat. And, and, you know, he looks, I think, to the people when they're watching him, he looks long and lean. I think he played uh, – I think in college he played at 240, and I think he's 230-something here. But he's a powerful guy, though. Powerful. I mean, he's like I said, long and lean. But man, he moves the pile, oh, yeah. doesn't he? Yes, he does, man. And you, um, you know, you get a, a corner or sometimes linebackers. I mean, he's he's ran over a couple linebackers, and I'm talking about running them straight smack over. And uh, and it's, it's it's good to watch anytime you have a running back that um, is willing to to really run the ball with some uh, an attitude. It really right. does a lot for your offensive line. You know, you you don't mind blocking for a guy that every time he runs, he's going to pick up four or five. And he, if he gets tackled in the backfield, you know, I'm not tackled in the backfield, hitting the backfield, he'll right, find a way right. to make a miss and, you know, get another three or four yards. So it's, 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 it's a great feeling to have a running back behind you that, um, you know, can, can score a touchdown any time he touches the ball. Man, the you- thing about him that impressed me as a rookie was his patience Absolutely. after he took the hand off or got the ball in his hands. I mean, so often – so often, young running backs, I mean, you know, they they want to, and, you know, they tend to hit it all the time instead of waiting for it, let the play develop, let you guys do your thing a little bit, and then, but Le'Veon Bell, too, uh, with that patience, I mean, he hits the hole. He's not a, you know, a dancer, one of those guys who's always trying to bounce it outside, bounce, you know what I mean? Because that stuff doesn't work in the NFL, uh, not on a consistent basis anyway. Yeah, he's he's a nice blend of patience and, I don't know, like it, it's kind of a savvy of knowing where the hole's going to be, seeing it and, and hitting it. That, to me, was, of all the things he showed as a rookie, that that was what made me think. Wow, this guy could be special. You know, uh, it's a game that I can I can actually go to. Uh, the the first Baltimore game when we came out in the Wildcat formation a couple times during the game, and we pulled a couple guys. We had Ben outside, you know, lined up as right. a receiver, and we brought uh, Antonio Brown in motion a couple times. And that guy, Le'Veon Bell, was so patient, waiting for David to kick out a a linebacker and, and the fullback to come up inside and, and make sure that hole was all cleaned up. Mm-hmm. And he took his time and just waited for the, the right time to, to pop it open. 
15, 10 yards out of just a wildcat formation. And we did that a couple of times throughout the year. And the guy just took his time and made sure he wanted he wanted to go when he was ready to go. And when that guy took off and was ready to go, he made some special happen. The other, the other, and since you brought up um, the Ravens, um, the other thing that Le'Veon Bell did to me that really impressed me was in Baltimore, down at the goal line. Um, you know, when you're running the ball against the Ravens in Baltimore down at the goal line, that is a different thing than running the ball probably against anyone else anywhere else in the NFL. So true. And um, he knew he was going to get lit up, but he put his head down in there and uh, should have been a touchdown. Uh, you know, the, the ruling uh, said that it was not. But that, to me, that was a – I mean, you like to see that from a running back, too, guy who is going to – Sell out. Right, sell out. Exactly. Good term, exactly. good term. We're talking with Steeler left tackle Calvin Beecham. He joins us here at the Pittsburgh Auto Show. Uh, Calvin will be with us un- until 1 p.m. Your uh, The numbers in the running game weren't what you wanted them to be, but we saw it get better as the year went on. Uh, you got a new offensive line coach. You got a new running back coach. You guys, uh, uh, you know, you get Marquise Pouncey back. We'll talk a little bit about Fernando Velasco, who did a tremendous job when he was in there. Uh, but you took some some steps along the way. The second half of the year, six and two. What can we expect from? Let's uh, stick with the running game for next year. You know, with the running game, I think we're going to be simple and and just do what we do. Uh, we're not going to really care about what the other team has to offer. We're going to run the ball like we want to run the ball. We're going to line up in the formation we want to line up in, and we're going to run a smack dab at you. And we're going to dare you to stop it. Um, and that's the mentality that we started to get uh, towards the end of the year. We really didn't care what anybody thought. Uh, as an offensive line especially. We didn't care um, how it looked, if it was pretty or if it was not. Uh, we was going to find a way to run the ball and run the ball well. Um, and it was a couple games, you know, there uh, uh, late into the season. You know, where I really started, I think, in the, the Buffalo game where, you know, Mike Adams was at tackle and just demolished the guy right into the end zone. And then we took it to Green Bay and, and ran the ball like we needed to in Green Bay. And the ball, like I said, mentioned earlier, the Baltimore game, the first one, um, and just ran the ball like we needed to. And, and, and as we move forward going into this next season, you know, I don't know the, the, the if we're going to change schemes or what we're going to change with the new offensive line coach or the philosophy. But I feel, you know, from a mindset standpoint, the offensive line really began to gravitate towards this mindset that we're going to run the ball. Um, and we're going to take, you know, we're going to take care of Ben. Um, we're going to make it easier on Ben. We're going to make sure we run the ball efficiently. So when we do drop back to pass or play action, you know, it's, it's nobody back there because they really are respecting the run, especially with Le'Veon back there. And that's what you also, uh, that you guys were able to do in the second half of the year. A lot of that uh, is due to Ben as well, but you were able to protect him. Now, I was going to ask you this. Do, do you, and it's probably too early to answer this, but would you expect the schemes uh, uh, to change uh, somewhat, stay the same? You know, uh, Munch ran a lot of uh, the outside zone stuff at Tennessee. It's something that you guys worked on in the offseason at training camp, and then, of course, we saw very little of it during the regular season. Where do you expect that to uh, kind of fall in line? You expect you know, to continue it or what? I think we will. Um, I think, you know, with Coach Munchak, there will be some tweaks, uh, some minor changes. He'll add some things, take some things away. But uh, it's kind of – I feel it's too early to kind of, you know, we haven't even started OTAs and, and, and seeing how things are going to work out. But, uh, you know, I look forward to however um, we find a way to, to, to run the ball. Um, you know, I think we've we've been creative in ways, and we've also been very traditional in ways. And, and either way it goes, we're going to find a way to get the job done. You we, Before we came on the air, you mentioned – you and I were talking, and you said you had a chance to talk uh, to Mike Munchak. Um, just relay, you know, what that uh, – first meeting was like you know just sitting down with with coach Munchak was was amazing um you know sitting down with a hall of famer uh, sitting down with a coach that had, had coached and then an offensive line coach that had coached but what he brought to the table was the fact that he played the game and he played the game at a high level and then he was able to articulate exactly what he learned um both from playing and then from coaching not and everybody can do that not everybody can as, do a, that. as a you know elite player exactly not everybody can do that and then be able to use those those skills to, to then teach younger guys like myself that that want to be great and, and want to, to you know somewhat mimic what uh what he had as a as a career um and just sitting down and just talking with them how we would 
uh, do things throughout the season. You know, he talked about trying to find a way to, to make sure the, the offensive linemen um, have more say, you know, on-field type of things where we take, like I said, taking taking some uh, some heat off of Ben and, and just uh, working together even more as a cohesive unit. And uh, like I said, I just can't wait to, to, to really sit down with him. I actually get to sit down with him a little bit next week while I'm still here in Pittsburgh. I just can't wait to sit down and just learn and, and thrive because I know it's going to be a great year. we got a, a great guy um, and a great coach, and I just can't wait to get started with him. Does that make a difference? Uh, with today's athlete, uh, because there, you know, there's a lot of good coaches uh, who've, who've some who haven't even played a game, but uh, at that level. But two, we're just you know kind of uh, uh, middle of the road players. But when you get a guy who was a Hall of Famer and was a 12-time Pro Bowler or whatever he was, how much of a difference does that make having that type of coach as opposed to maybe a, you know an X's and O's schemes kind of guy? You know, having a guy like that, you respect what he says even more. Um, I had a coach in, in college that, that won three Super Bowls and played for New England Patriots. Um, and everything he said, I took it to heart. And it just, I, th- I just feel as it, it goes, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's real. It, Credibility. It was it's, it's, cred- it's credible. It, it happened. He did it. And he thrived in it. Bob and I have that. <laughs> well, we talk. We have that credibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's – it's, it's, I mean, it's, you can't even – you can't even – it's hard to describe right, because, right. you know, it's – he says this, he did this, he did it at a high level. Why wouldn't you want to do something right. like that? Why wouldn't you want to use the advice that he has, the experiences that he has? Why wouldn't you want to use those to become a better player? And and what he has to offer, you know, where, where else do you need to go, you know? And uh, I'll tell you what, I, I in just in the area, and, and this might be – particularly true for David DeCastro because he was a, he is a right guard and Munchak played right guard but just imagine the little tricks of the trade he could he could impart upon a right guard who you know might need to know where the umpire is to you know get a certain uh, block let's say you know <laughs> on a defensive player but I mean those kind of things you know knowing when you can get away with some things and maybe knowing when you cannot uh, uh, to me, those kind of that nuance, those tricks of the trade thing, to me, really can be the difference because, you know, NFL games five, six plays determine who wins and who loses, it, and sometimes those plays can be penalties or, that's you know, true. big plays by the defense or something, hey, and or big plays by the offense. That, right, that, exactly. That, that, that experience that he happened to to talk about, right, was something that you happened to do in the game, right, at sprung, the right at time, the, at the right time yep. that sprung a running back. Yeah. You know, I mean, you never know. And that's that's the type of experiences and that's the type of knowledge that Coach Munchak has, and, and that's what I gathered just from 15 minutes of sitting down with him. Just imagine <laughs> right. what would happen when I get to sit down with him, you know, all the OTAs, all the training camp, all of, you know, all of the season. So I, I'm excited. <clears throat> Have you had a chance to um, uh, talk to Fernando? And as I said, when he stepped in for when Marquise Pouncey was injured in, in eight plays into the year, and then they assigned him from Tennessee, um, I know he really liked Mike Munchak. Even though he was cut there, I don't think that was Munch's decision. That was a salary cap move that they had to make. Um, but he played so well for you guys. And then, of course, he had the uh, season-ending injury as well. Uh, he, he just came in for one year. Have, uh, do you, do you, have you gotten any sense? Uh, I know he wants to go be a starter. He wants to play. And he showed, certainly, that he can do that. I don't know if his injury is going to hold him back. But anyways, have you talked to him about you know, what he would like to do. Do you think there's a chance that they can bring him back? Because so, all of a sudden, now your offensive line and the depth and everything looks really good. It looks really good. You know, um, with Fernando coming in, it, it was it was, <laughs> it was was almost uh, almost perfect. You know, I had... He's just, not a good guy, is he? He's a, <laughs> hey, Fernando is an up-class, he is, great guy. He is. The, uh, um, you're right. Imagine first how, rate. how different your life might have been Who if he didn't him? if he didn't come in. Man, <laughs> going, going into... Uh, going into Cincinnati, my first actual start at center. At center, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe playing that position all year. I and mean, you you never you know you never know you never know how God God will work things out, man. You'd but, have uh, Geno right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> center, man, that's my, my first start against Geno Smith at center. Uh, Would have been almost as, as difficult as having you know Terrell Suggs would get my first start at tackle. So. Yeah, well, that was like. Uh, uh, Trey Essex gets a Dwight Freeney, right? Oh, in, yeah. in Indy. In, in Indy. Indy. In, in Indy. Indy. Oh, in Indy. On a Monday night. Oh, my God. <laughs> man. But, man, it's, 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 uh, he's, he's a great guy. He really uh, is. I love him and his wife. Uh, they, they've been mentors to me, me and my wife. But, uh, you know, I, I hope, you know, you just – 
in this business, you never know how things uh, right. roll out. Right. Um, he's he's actually recovering really good, um, doing some running in the pool. I've, I've you know worked out with him since we've been here in Pittsburgh, and uh, I, I you know you don't never know. You never know. You never know how things will work out with Pouncey. You never know how. You know his recovery will go, but you know it's 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 a good thing to have competition. Yeah, he he is a good dude, I, and he's just, he came in and just did a tremendous, tremendous job. Tremendous yeah, job. Really happy tremendous for him. Tremendous job. Hope he hangs around for another year, but uh, you know if the, we'll we'll see what happens in free agency. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about the combine, what the experience was like uh, uh, for you, and uh, just what a young player has to go through to one get ready for it and two go through it. We'll take a break. Jerry Dulac and Bob Labriola were broadcasting uh, from the Pittsburgh Auto Show at the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. Calvin Beecham joins us. He'll be with us until 1 o'clock. Bob and I will be here until 2. We'll take a break and come back with more. It's 970 ESPN. Welcome back to uh, the uh, David L. Lawrence Convention Center. It's the Pittsburgh Auto Show. We're broadcasting from the uh, Ford Display. And uh, if you're... uh, Coming to the show or at the show, stop on over and say hello. Calvin Beecham, uh, the Steeler left tackle, joins us here. will be with us uh, for this segment up until 1 o'clock. And then Bob Labriola and I will be uh, with you for the next hour up until 2 p.m. Here uh, at the Auto Show, the NFL Scouting Combine begins uh, Thursday in Indianapolis. And uh, uh, Calvin, was that a a, a time of uh, angst uh, for you or was it something you look forward to? And uh, not everybody gets to go. Enough guys get to go. But did you have to prepare hard for it? And what was that whole process uh, like for you? Um, it was a lot of preparation. Um, I actually trained in Indianapolis. Oh, did you? Uh, yes, sir. My, my agency is based out of Fort Wayne, which is about 40, 40 miles uh, east of uh, Indianapolis. So I trained there in Indianapolis. So it wasn't a, a long way to go. Right, <laughs> right. To go to the combine. But, you know, you're very excited about getting the invite you know you hear the stories and you're like well it can't be that bad so you go there and then you experience it for yourself and uh you leave a different way than <laughs> than you came um it's, it's very uh it's somewhat stressful you know it's a lot a lot of stuff going on you got a lot of scouts around you got a lot of stuff going on you got testing you got to take you got the the, the, the bench test you got the 40 you got the agility drills you got the you know psych test i mean it's, it's just a lot of stuff that, that goes on within a very compact uh, compact amount of time. What was the most stressful part? The the interview process, the psych test, or was it the uh, the actual drills, knowing that this was... Uh, because you went in, you know, I'm sure that was an opportunity for you to shine, mm-hmm. correct? I mean, correct. You, you felt like, hey, I can show them something here. And, and so which part of that was the more stressful you know the most stressful part for me um was was actually checking in <laughs> was <that right? laughs> i was checking in and man my phone was blowing up with just these unknown numbers that i've never seen in my life from washington from seattle from uh maryland from pittsburgh from texas from you know arizona and i'm like should i answer these or should i not because i've never seen these numbers before so i didn't know if it was you know a possible scout calling to try to you know talk to me while i'm there you know i didn't know what was going on um but you know another another thing was um uh the psych test you know sitting there just waiting and you know i've never <laughs> taken a, a psych evaluation before or taken a test to find out you know what type of mental capabilities i have so it, it was different it was a uh, very trying well you're i mean you're an accomplished student i mean graduated uh spoke at commencement mm-hmm. um you know, I, I wouldn't think that that you would think that you know because of all of the people at the combine invited, you had to be one of the ten smartest. I probably was, but I, you just wouldn't. That's that wasn't on your agenda. You know, you're thinking <laughs> I'm gonna go run the forty. I'm gonna go, you know, do the two twenty five test. I'm gonna talk to a couple right. of coaches. I mean, a couple of scouts. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't expecting. You know, psych evaluations. You know, you you know you have to. Uh, what test is that? You have to take uh, Wonderlic. Wonderlic. the Wonderlick. Yeah. You know, you know you have to take the Wonderlick, but all the other tests, and you just, you know, I just wasn't prepared for. It, didn't even think about. It, didn't even know about it till I got there. Now, how did you? How, aside from that, how did you test in the drills? And and you last to the seventh round. Did you get an indication at the time that you might go earlier? Or did you work yourself into the draft? How did it play out for you? You know, um, I didn't know exactly where I would get drafted. I knew I, I would get drafted. I knew I had the possibility of getting drafted. Um, you know, with the combine, my numbers were, uh, were not, you know, just one of those top type numbers. You know, my 40 was okay, you know, which they really don't care too much about for offensive right, linemen. Right. You know, the big thing for us is the, the 225 test. Um, I did do too well um, in that, which I, you know, 
understood and, and, and knew that it would, you know, affect my stock, you know, if people really put much stock into it. But, uh, you know, I knew I would get drafted. Didn't know You're what talking I would talking about get the bench, right? Exactly, yes, the bench. Right, the right. bench press, the 225 uh, bench press. Um, you know, but didn't know where I would get drafted, knew I would get drafted. You know, was hoping to get drafted higher, but, you know, that's part of football. You know, uh, you know where you come in is, is not – um, all that matters, but it's about where you where you finish at. And uh, I understood that, and you know, that's one of those things that, that drives me to be better and and uh, understand where I was drafted at, and, and, and understand that that's a stigma that that will stick with me for a while, and, and one of those things that I uh, need to erase. So, Kelvin, if we had had this conversation before you went to the combine the year you were invited, mm-hmm. what I would have told you is that the most important part of the combine. This is from talking to Kevin Colbert and and the Steelers scouts and Mike Tomlin is the interview Mm -hmm. and then your game tape. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other stuff is as long as you don't, uh, you know, they have lines, you know, the the Mendoza line, you've heard that in baseball. Well, there are lines where you can't be below performance uh, in certain things, but workout warriors, um, it's not necessarily uh, the people that the Steelers go after. And the thing was, you know, with with the coach's interview, I'm, I was so used to being around coaches. You know, Coach Jones was was a great coach, actually coaching the National Football League. And like I talked about earlier, Coach Clem actually played in the league. You know, I, I knew what knew how that relationship and how that conversation would go and had some sense of, of, of how that would go. You know, I was one of those guys that I didn't mind being put up on the whiteboard. You know, I love drawing plays. I love seeing how, you know, how the scheme is going to work out this week. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I love that. So that that really wasn't something that I was too much worried about because I was very comfortable with doing it. We only have about a minute left. Did you talk to the Steelers at the time? And I do believe they brought you back in, didn't they, after that? They did. So did you, you had a feel that they might try to take you? You know, I, I sat down with, uh, at the time, Sean Kugler, who was the offensive right. line coach, and, and uh, Sean Surrett who was the uh, the quality control guy. So I, ha- you know, had a sense of, you know, maybe, you know, this is a team that, that I know likes me. So it was one of those things I was going to wait and see, and then they brought me back in, and, you know, things kind of went from there. Did, were you starting to get a little antsy when the round, the seventh round, was uh, kind of uh, flittering away and uh, <laughs> your name still hadn't been called? I did, man. You know, a lot of free agent um, calls that started to come in, had a lot of those start to come in. So, you know, I knew, uh, you know, time was running out, but I knew I still had to play football, and I knew if I had an opportunity to show, show what I can do, I know I would be ready. And here you are, the Steelers uh, starting left tackle. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, thanks for joining us, Calvin. Best of luck with you. We enjoyed having you, and uh, we'll, we'll catch up with you soon. Enjoy yes, the offseason. Yeah.